Everybody take a seat and we're going to get started. we got to get out of here. And now I'm going to introduce you uh, Pat Martin. <laughs> All right, fellow Toastmasters, please once again ensure that your devices are silent and hold off on taking photos. I promise you we'll make a way so you can take your picture with your uh, club members. At this time, we're going to go ahead because we're going to move right along for the International Speech Contest. Yay! Yeah. Once again, after each of the contestants speak, I will ask for one minute of silence. And after the last speaker speak, the judges will have not, I won't say all the time they will need to complete their ballot, but please wrap it up, complete the ballot, sign it, and date it, and pass it on. At this time, I will give you the speaking order of the contest. Our first contestant, Sonia Elbow to Men, contestant number one. Contestant number two. Yvonne Bailey. Contestant number three, Dwayne Jackson. Contestant number four, Matthew Walsh. Contestant number five, Joaquin Jackson. Joaquin. Joaquin, Joaquin Jackson. Thank you. Okay. Let's get ready. <laughs> Let this contest begin. Leaving the house every morning, 
Child, don't you get in no more fights. If you see trouble, you better run. <laughs> I was in the sixth grade with a reputation. Me run? Please. <laughs> I had a decision to make. I could stay and fight and get the tail beat out of me, get my tail beat, or I could listen to what mama and mama said and run. So at 3.15, when the bell rang, man, I broke out on one of these Wilma Rudolph Flojo sprints. <laughs> Mama thought I left school early. <laughs> Fight, flight, just do something. In the movie, Forrest Gump, Forrest said these words. My mama always said, <laughs> life was like Box of chocolates. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> the year 2011 was that type of year for my family and I. Single mother with five children. Yes, I did five. Got my own basketball team. <laughs> <laughs> In 2011 alone, I lost my job. Months later, I lost my home and became homeless. A month later after that, I blew the engine in my car. So here I am, no job. I'm homeless with five and no transportation. Then, trying to keep everything as normal as possible, I go to the doctor thinking I had a sinus infection and got a bad report. What the doctor said was, your brain is leaky, and you have to have emergency sur surgery. Five kids, homeless, no transportation, no job. I do not have time for no surgery. But I was at a moment where freezing was not an option. I was at a moment where taking flight and running was not an option. So you know what I did? I went back to what I knew. And that time, like B.B. King, I was singing the blues. The thrill is gone and crying like the Tin Man and the Wizard of Oz. A tea, a tea, a tea. The thrill has gone away all at the same time. But when I got through, I took my stance, I put on my gloves, and I went back to what I knew. The first punch I threw, I got me a car. After I got that car, I went in and I had the surgery, October 30th. They had to resuscitate me. Mm. Woke back up. <laughs> <laughs> November the 19th, threw another punch when I signed the lease on a new house that was bigger and better than the one I had before. Right. And by March 2012, I got me a government job. Oh. <laughs> Fight. Flight. Just do something. It doesn't matter what happens in your life. What matters is how you react. Frederick, Doug Frederick Roosevelt once said, one thing for sure, we must do something. When I was fighting, when I got weak and could no longer fight like a man, I didn't stop fighting. I simply swung like a girl. <laughs> what is it that you have to
to make a decision on. Don't freeze. Because fellow Toastmasters and guests, you can fight, you can take flight, but you must do something. I had to have a repeat. 
prepared the next day, but I didn't mind because my son learned to ride a bike. And I realized this kid can do anything if he will just try. When Phil was three years old, we enrolled him at a university daycare. He was there one week. They called me. Come and get your son. <laughs> this is not the appropriate environment for him. He needs more support than we have available. Besides, we're afraid for his safety. I said, well, what is he doing? He's banging on the windows. He's jumping on the table. He's taking other people's food. I get the picture. I take my son and go home. I call my older sister. I explain to her what happened. She loved him so much. She said, I'll keep Philip for you during the day. She kept him for two years. And it was about that time that we realized <coughs> Philip was doing better. He was understanding the world around him. So I got to try again in my heart. And I went back to that university. And I asked them for another chance. And they said, we give you a one week trial. <laughs> <laughs> that one week turned into seven years. Oh. I tried again, turned into a triumph. Because nothing beats a failure but a trial. Seven years. That's how long I was married when I decided I wanted a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't working out. Total chaos. <laughs> Went to the lawyer. Drew up the papers, and then the lawyer said to me, do a favor for me. Wait one week. If you still decide to go through with this, I'll represent you. I waited one week. My husband and I had heart to heart. He said, I can't change the past. And if you decide to leave, I respect your decision. But if you decide to stay, I will show you one day at a time that I love you. <laughs> I believed him. <laughs> so we tried again. We've been married for 31 years. Contestant number three, Dwayne Jackson. Live your life from the director's chair. Live your life from the director's chair, Dwayne Jackson. <laughs> Lights, 
camera, action. Now, if your life was a movie, what kind of story would it tell? You see, it has been said that the entire world is a stage and that you play a role in the grand production of your life. The question is, are you in a starring role or are you an extra? The main question is, how can you sit in the director's chair? Madam Toastmaster, friends, judges, <laughs> I will never forget. It was a cold evening in Chicago. I was in a college, I was at the college campus, and I was in my cluttered cubicle. And I was staring at this shiny name badge. It says Dwayne Jackson, college admissions rep. If you imagine, we will take you there. Now, see, my job was to help people live their dreams for $80,000. <laughs> <laughs> But I wasn't living my own dreams. In fact, the only thing that looked good in my office was Miss South Africa 2010 <laughs> in my Toastmaster magazine. <laughs> you see, her smile would just take me to a place where I felt like I was living my dream, standing on the stage like this one, transforming lives. Now, how do you put your dreams on the shelf? You see, every piece of dust that was on this magazine represented my dreams of being on the stage just fading away. That's when the phone rang. Hello? Slow down. See, it was Phoenix. Now, Phoenix was a 25-year-old woman whom I interviewed a week before. Now, she had traveled all the way from Ghana just to come to America so she can learn how to be the best film director on the planet. However, her father, he didn't really like entertainment, so he wanted her to study business instead. And I remember the phone got real hot on my face. When Phoenix said, I don't want to live my life, my father says that I'm a failure because I failed the entrance exam and I am ready to die. Now, what would you say in a situation like that? Have you ever felt another person's pain so deep that it cut you just like a knife? What would Miss South Africa say in the situation? <laughs> I never opened up the cover. I never got past it, so I don't know. <laughs> but I do know that I had to say something to inspire this talented but this tormented young woman. Her love for movies. Phoenix, have you ever seen the movie The Wizard of Oz? Dwayne, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> You see, I want you to picture this. In The Wizard of Oz, there's a main character. Her name's Dorothy. Now, she's absorbed in this enormous whirlwind, and it propels her to this land called Oz. Now, Dorothy just has one dream. She wants to get back home. She wants to get to a place where that grass bends in Selena, and every raindrop that fell had a meaning. But she couldn't just <coughs> she couldn't get it. And just like Dorothy, there's so many of us who have dreams. But we're also <coughs> absorbed in that enormous whirlwind of life. And it propels us to a land called monthly obligations. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a place that's filled with other people's expectations. This is a place filled with unfulfilled desires. And there's so few of us that actually make that step to live the lives that we want. So I told her, I said, I said, Phoenix, if you truly, if you truly believe in being a movie director, I believe that the greatest movie you will ever direct is your own life story. You see, in the story of your life, you are the main character. 
You're also the director. But the moment that we forget that we can write that script is when our epic adventure can turn into a tragedy. And I told her, I said, Phoenix, if you're going to be a director, show the world a better script than a life story that ends in suicide. You see, because in the end, all living will surely die. But death, death is not the ultimate tragedy. The ultimate tragedy is to come to that fateful day only then to realize that you never really lived. And that's when the phone went silent. And all of a sudden I heard a loud pop. And I remember looking at my hand shaking, and I thought the worst had happened. And that's when Phoenix said, that was so inspiring. I dropped the phone on the floor. <laughs> Thank you for helping me realize. She said, there are no bad days. There's only bad directors. And see, I remember sitting back at my desk and I was staring at this same magazine and I thought to myself, perhaps we don't need a stage to be directors. Maybe we can take the opportunity to, be the, to sit in a director's chair provided by our own lives. And I said, now, did I just save her life or did she just save mine? And I wonder if each of us have a deep-seated desire, just like Phoenix, to live our dreams. But the moment you think that your dreams can come true, I encourage you. If you can't fly, then run. And if you can't walk, then crawl, no matter what it takes to sit in the director's chair and live your life. Madam President. Contestant number four, Matthew Walsh. Matthew Walsh, five one thousand. Five one thousand, Matthew Walsh. <laughs> ourselves across the line of scrimmage. The defense was less organized, but they too took up their positions across from us. I was playing quarterback. So I put the football in front of me and I said, down, ready, set. Everyone on the offense leaned a little bit forward. Everyone on the defense leaned a little bit back. Hut one, hut two. Everyone froze. Hike. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and welcome guests. This was a typical scene at the schoolyard near my house when I was growing up, and we used to play pickup games of touch football. <coughs> we tried to make those games as much like the pros we saw on TV as we could. Some of us wore jerseys with our favorite players' names on the back. In my day, those names were Sayers and Butkus. 
We call our plays things like Red Dog Blue and 54 Power, and I don't know why we call them that. <laughs> but we did. I loved playing football. I loved it, and I played it every single day. Because I wanted to be like those guys on television. But one thing we couldn't duplicate was an offensive line. Someone who would block for the quarterback. Because everyone wanted to be a wide receiver and score the touchdown. So we compensated. We used the traditional rush count. That meant that after the ball was hiked, the defender had to wait a few seconds and let the play develop. And as he did, he had to count out loud, being sure to add 1,000 to the end to be sure that a full second had elapsed. In my day, the rush count was always up to five, 1,000. In my eighth grade year, I joined an organized league in my hometown of Forest Park. We had helmets and referees and coaches. One day we even put that black stuff under our eyes. I, I don't know what it was for, <laughs> but we felt like football players. Now I learned a great deal about the game of football and about the roles of all the players during that one season that I played organized ball. But the truth is, I learned more about the game of life and my role in it during those five seconds on the schoolyard. These are lessons that I carry with me to this day and lessons that I would like to share with you tonight. One 1,000. Know the rules. When we played football, you couldn't throw toward nor run near the trees on the west side of the field. They were out of bounds. If you did this, the play was called dead and you took a penalty. You might think we were afraid of running into the trees, but that had nothing to do with it. No, the trees were out of bounds because that's where the neighborhood dogs tended to do their business. <laughs> so nobody goes near the trees. <laughs> but this rule applies no matter what game you're playing, whether it's school, you got football, or you're climbing that corporate ladder, or you're playing the most dangerous game of all, the game of love. <laughs> if you don't know the rules, you might step in it. <laughs> Two 1,000, understand your job. Now as quarterback, I had to find an open man and throw the ball to where he would be in a few seconds. Now I could have run the ball up the field, that was an option, but it would have been selfish. I mean, why have a team made up entirely of wide receivers if you're not going to give them something to receive? Mm -hmm. But we all play a role in every aspect of our lives. Our job is to play that role to the best of our ability. 3-1,000. Keep your eyes open and your head in the game. Mm -hmm. When I hiked that football, there were six little boys going in what appeared to be 15 different directions. <laughs> <laughs> I had to determine, and quickly, who was wide open, who might get open in a few seconds, who was never going to get open. That was my brother, by the way. <laughs> and I had to do this quickly, all the time, keeping a wary eye on that defender who was counting down a few feet away from me. Each play was chaos, and it seems as if not much has changed. Today in our busy world, it seems like every day is chaos, and we're being pulled in 15 different directions, aren't we? The only way to handle a stressful situation like that is to gather as much information as you can in the time available, all while keeping your mind focused on the task at hand. Four 1,000. Keep moving. There's no better way to get tackled, whether it's by a football player or by life, than to just stand still. And no one's ever gotten ahead by remaining where they are. True that. So keep your feet and your mind moving, even if it's from side to side, because sometimes new opportunities are only available, are only visible, are only obvious to you from a new angle. Mm -hmm. The great motivational speaker, Dale Carnegie, once said, inaction breeds doubt and fear. Mm -hmm. But action breeds confidence and courage. If you want to defeat fear, don't sit at home talking about it. Get out and get busy. And five 1,000. Every once in a while, you just got to heave one down the field. <laughs> if you watch the sports after the day of football, they show the highlights. And what are those highlights usually? It's a, a long pass, 65, 80 yards. They never show a three-yard run. <laughs> That's because good things happen when you take chances, when you take a different path, when you try something different, right? 
Someday, my friends, we're all going to be asked to review the game we've played right here on Earth. Be sure that you include some highlights. A great football coach once said, Some people believe that the game of football is a matter of life and death. Let me assure you, my friends, it's, it's much more important than that. <laughs> well, he was joking. Of course, football is just a game. But there are lessons to be learned in everything we do in life, including our games. These are lessons that can be learned in as little as five seconds. Now, who's up for some football? <laughs> Man, <it's all> <laughs> into any inner city neighborhood, we will be able to check in on certain individuals. We will be able to ask what is going on and what we will be able to find. Our children, our promising children, are having difficulty making it to the next level. Matter of fact, if we were to leave this place and reappear in a low-income, crime-escalated neighborhood, we will be able to listen in on certain questions in the minds of parents, single-parent moms, and children. Then we'll be able to listen by the echoes of their deep thoughts in their minds. When is my child? When is my baby daddy? When is my mother or father coming home from prison? <clears throat> Folks, be aware that slavery has not been abolished. It is just only taking a new twist, put on a new face, hitting a new direction, and simply has a new facade. Corporate America has changed the new slave. When you look and you see for yourself, in America, and I'll just take Chicago for one, they're willing to pay $10,000 for a student to be educated, but they're willing to pay $35,000 to forty dollars to be incarcerated. It does not take a mathematician to understand where the money is being invested. So the new slave ship is not school. <coughs> It's the penitentiary. Stay with me for a moment. When we're looking at the fact that there has been a new slave ship, what are we actually looking at? That means that people, individuals, have to be crowded in, set upon one another. 
not in a closed environment, and not in an open environment, but a closed environment that allows nobody to think freely, feel free, act free, let alone be free. This new slave ship, how did it start? It started before you and I ever made it on this planet. So what are you looking at? I'm looking at something that has made a turn into the 21st century. It has made a turn into the 21st century simply to eradicate any of our children ever making it to the next level. What do you mean by that? Well, this new slave ship has already delivered over 2.3 million in prisons across the country. One million of that number represents African Americans. The census says that African Americans only constitute between 12 to 14 percent of the population in the United States of America. But we make up a whopping 40 percent or better in the penal institution. And what does that mean? We are the majority. My God. What does that mean? That means no entitlement. That means that is a, a debt that is unpaid and society is not willing to accept payment in full. What are you saying then? The new slave ship? They're not accepting payment? So what does that mean? Slavery can't vote. Slavery can't be educated. Slavery, you have to have documentation that says you are a free slave. Felony cannot vote. Felony cannot get grants to go to college. Felony, have to get a sponge document that say free slave, again. <coughs> what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? And where are we going to start? Simply, we're going to have to start with the next generation. We have to create a new program, a new system, a declaration, a proclamation, whichever one feels best to you. But the one thing that we do have to do, we have to be able to equip and empower our next generation with victory. We have to ensure that they will never walk on the planks of those old slave ships. We have to ensure that they will never check in and sleep on the port or starboard side of any thing that is not of their highest good. Simply, we have to make sure that they will never be put in the holes of darkness of never knowing who they are. And simply, we have to identify those bounty hunters who will come, rob, mm -hmm. steal their youth, and destroy any future possibilities. Simply today, what is it that we have to do? We have to keep encouraging them. We understand that this won't happen overnight. And we're simply aware that if they're going to close a school, school always started at home. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll say it again. Amen. Even if they're going to close a school, school always started at home. So it leaves us with one thing for sure. One day, not probably today, but surely one day. Probably not next week, but surely one day. Probably not next month, but one day we're going to have to dock those vessels once and for all. That is toast time. Thank you. 
I would really like to first thank all the judges and the functionaries, especially the judges, for the job task that they had to do. Club name is Bold Literary Talkers in Hyde Park, and the club number is 708-973. Okay. <laughs> I've been a Toastmaster 18 years. Oh. My educational goal this year is to get my advanced communicator bronze for the second second time around. By June 30th, correct? Yes. All right, okay. <laughs> Yay. Yes. Your club name is South Suburban. Okay. Five, five, three, four. Since 1936. Uh, <laughs> 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 what education do you have completed by June 30th? CC. Oh, great. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Y'all heard it here first, right? 
Okay. Uh, Matt Walsh, Oak Lawn Toastmasters, 872-531. I've been at Toastmasters five years, thank you, I can never remember. And by the end of the year, I'll be Advanced Communicator Bronze. All right. My name is Joaquin Jackson. I'm at Christ Universal Toastmaster number two, number 667-117. Yes, there's one other person up here. And this, I'm going into my second year. Okay. And I'm looking at AC. All right. Now, on behalf of South Division, I would like to present to you the certificate of participation in the international speech contest. Take a good look.